Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who freely gives living water from the spring of the water of life. Text for meditation today comes from Revelation chapter 21, as previously read. Two different people can look out at the same world, a world full of death and mourning and crying and pain, and they can come to two opposite conclusions. These are the two conclusions. One, maybe God is almighty, but he's not good. Or two, maybe God is good, but he's not almighty. Let me give you an example of both. A woman has suffered terrible atrocities at the hands of a man who was supposed to love her and protect her. And now she can't help but feel like all the while God was sitting up there on his throne while she was suffering and he had the power to help, but he didn't. He didn't do anything about her suffering. And so she can't help but feel that maybe God is powerful, but if he doesn't use that power to help, to help me, then what good is he? And as she thinks about her God and the brokenness of her world, the brokenness of her world just is a constant reminder of the God that she thinks is broken too. And so she finds herself angry. Do you feel that kind of anger in your life? On the other hand, a different man might come to the totally opposite conclusion, and yet both conclusions are really similar because they leave you in the same place, broken. This man has grown up knowing the goodness of God his entire life, and he has seen that goodness, but now he has had the person that he loves most in this world torn away from him by death, and it seems like not even God could stop it. Not even God could hold back death. Not even God could deliver on his promises and answer his prayers and heal the person that he loved most. And so now this man starts to think, well, maybe God is good, but if he's not powerful enough to do anything about it, then what's the use? What good is he? And he begins to despair about going to that God. Have you ever felt that kind of despair in your life? It's two different people with, very two, with two very real conclusions, both of which are brought on by the real brokenness and suffering of this world. But today we have to ask ourselves this, is one or both of those conclusions right? Is that all there is? Is this world just broken and that's it? Or is there another answer? Is there something else beyond this broken world that is so hard for us to see because of the wreckage of sin in our lives and in this world? Today our text from Revelation chapter 21, the second last chapter of the Bible, gives us that other answer. God's final answer for how he deals with the brokenness of this world. It shows us how God in his grace and by his power will bring everything back to the way he created it to be. He will bring everything back to be better than we could ever want or expect. God will do that very thing trouble is we don't like the way that he does it or when he does it because it's not the way that we would expect it to be. God's final answer calls us to wait patiently. It calls us to endurance. It calls us to walk by faith and not by sight. 
It calls us to trust in the promise of the one who sits on the throne and says, I am making everything new. But in the midst of our pain, and especially when our pain is the worst, it becomes the hardest to trust those words, I am making everything new. Do you struggle to trust that God is, in fact, doing that very thing in the midst of whatever real and hard trouble you are bearing in the midst of whatever suffering or disease or death or hardship that has come into your life, that God is indeed preparing for you a new heaven and a new earth and preparing you to be a new creation and inherit all of it. That is the promise that God lays before us in Revelation 21. Where the Apostle John records his vision given from Jesus, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. You see, this world and all of its pain is not all that there is and is not all that there will be. God has promised us a new world in store. The Apostle Peter tells us that same thing. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth will, the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Now that promise, his promise that Peter is talking about It's a promise God already had made back 700 years before during the time of the prophet Isaiah when God said, see, I will create a new heavens and a new earth and the former things will not be remembered nor will they come to mind but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create or I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem And take delight in my people and the sound of weeping and of crying will be heard no more. Don't think that God has forgotten that promise over the centuries. As if he's left it on the back shelf and he's not going to fulfill it because those are exactly the same things that John speaks of in his vision from Revelation of the new heavens and the new earth. John goes on, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And next, John goes on to describe exactly what it will be like in this new heaven and new earth. It will be everything we've ever hoped for, everything we've ever longed for. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. See, dear friends, God is not ignorant of the shape that that this world is in and he has not forgotten. He knows exactly what needs to be done in order to bring this world back to be everything it should be, everything that he created it to be. And in the meantime, while we wait for this vision to come true, we have to trust the words of the promise of him who sits on the throne and says, I am making everything new. Well, what assurances do we have that he is doing that very thing in the midst of everything that we see in this world that makes it look like he's not doing anything? or that he's simply up there taking the nap, or that he took a vacation from us. What do we have as a guarantee? Sure, he says, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. But what are the assurances that he gives us 
that this is indeed trustworthy and true. The guarantee that we have comes from looking at the work that he has already finished. The work that he has already done as a guarantee of everything that is yet to come. Of all things, there's a Hollywood movie that put this into a beautiful perspective for me with a brilliant scene. It comes from Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. See, Jesus has been condemned to death. He's on that way to Calvary where the soldiers are following along him, with him. And Jesus has been beaten within an inch of his life. And he stumbles beneath the weight of the cross and the soldiers take just another opportunity to pile on more blows and more insults. And so Jesus falls to his knees and the scene shows Jesus' mother who's watching from along the path and she reaches out to him. And Jesus looks at his mother and he utters these words, I am making everything new. Now, there is no gospel account that records Jesus speaking those words along the path. We have no guarantee that Jesus spoke those words. But the brilliance of the scene is that the scriptures proclaim the certainty of the truth that as Jesus was enduring the cross for us, he was indeed making everything new. Ephesians chapter 5 tells us Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And again, we're told if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. That's you. The new creation. That's you and every believer in Christ who has gone ahead of you. Who enjoys now the bliss of the holy city. The new Jerusalem that has been prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. <clears throat> That's you and every believer in Christ who has the confidence of everything that Jesus has already done on your behalf. He has lived and he has died. He has suffered every pain that you could have possibly suffered in this life and more. He knows it. And as he died on the cross to make everything new, he cried out that it was finished. And now the voice of the one who sits on the throne reminds us of that very same thing Jesus cried. The voice says, it is done. These words that I said would be fulfilled, they are trustworthy and true because they have been done. So how do we wait in the meantime? How do we wait keeping our hope? How do we wait remaining prepared for the end to come? How do we wait even with the sensation that the wait is so long and so painful? Well, first we wait remembering exactly what it is that we will receive. The new Jerusalem, the holy city, the home of righteousness. And we wait, also acknowledging that God is carrying out his plan to make everything new according to his plan. Romans chapter 8 tells us that creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. In this hope we were saved. But who hopes for what they already have? Well, nobody hopes for that. But if we hope for what we do not have, 
We wait for it patiently. Now that's a word that we don't so much like. We learned not to like it when we were kids. Patience. But that's how God calls us to wait. Knowing what we will receive, waiting for it patiently. And finally, as we wait, we start to live like the holy people that God has created us to be. We start that life that life even now. Peter encourages us, dear friends, since you are looking forward to the new heaven and the new earth, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Oh, how will be. Thanks so much for worshiping with us today. We hope that God's word has strengthened your faith. To help us know more about the reach of our efforts here at Manav, we hope that you'll like and subscribe to our YouTube and Facebook pages, and that you also sign our online friendship register to let us know that you're listening today. God bless and keep you.